I'm Stephanie Furman, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this, the first uh, sustainable development seminar of this fall. Um, we'll be talking today, yeah. am I too close? We'll be talking today about new record low in Arctic sea ice extent. And um, I just, the timing is really um, uh, um, propitious in that just hours ago, the National Snow and Ice Data Center released the, um, an estimate that we probably reached this year's minimum on Sunday um, at 3.41 million square kilometers. Uh, what's amazing about this number is that it's very close to half what the long-term average was of 1979 through 2000, which was 6.7 million square kilometers. So we'll be talking about these changes and setting some context for them. The speakers today will be me. I'll start out with the status in the future, um, some projections for the future of Arctic sea ice, what this might mean. And I'll also talk about the Earth Institute role and some of the things that we're doing within the Earth Institute. My background is in Arctic sea ice, and I've become increasingly interested in recent years in commu communicating about Arctic sea ice and in education. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. The second speaker will be Peter Schlosser, and he'll talk about pan-Arctic environmental changes. Peter was the former chair of the Study of Environmental Arctic Change, and he's also on the International Arctic um, Study of International Study of Arctic Change. And there's complete biographies in the um, the handouts that are out by the by on the table. The sec the third speaker will be Ann Siders, and she just came here from uh, the Navy. She's a postgraduate research fellow now at the Columbia uh, Center for Climate Change Law. And she was, just until recently, Presidential Management Fellow with the U.S. Navy. So she'll be talking about operational challenges. And our fourth speaker will be Ben Arlov. He's with the Center for Research on Environmental Decisions. And he's, has he's an anthropologist, and he's studied um, climate change, including the loss of iconic landscapes. After that, we'll have a discussion. So the Arctic sea ice, what is the status of it? Um, what happened this summer? What does this mean for the future? What are some roles for the Earth Institute in terms of research, practice, education, and communication? So to talk about what happened this summer, I'll talk both about the sea ice extent, which has been in the news, and also about the sea ice thickness. To set the background for this, I just want to show these two um, plots, and these are not about this summer's minimum, but just to, to um, lay the groundwork. So the minimum, um, Sea ice extent usually happens in mid-September, as happened this year. What happens is that you have a lot of melting of ice over the, the summertime, and then around September you reach the minimum, and after this you start growing more ice. The wintertime extent is usually, uh, maximum extent is usually reached sometime in February, and as shown in this, this image, it's quite extensive. So even in a warming world, we're expecting for sea ice to continue to grow in the wintertime. And this is something that is often lost in the message when people talk about you know, an Arctic without sea ice or with minimal sea ice, they don't really, people don't really realize that each winter for quite some time we're expecting ice to regrow in the winter time. So what happened this year? You can see the trend here. When I first started working on sea ice, it was in 1980, was my first expedition up into the Arctic. And at that time, the ice extent was about 8 million square kilometers in, 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 um, in August. And what you can see here is that ever since that time, the, the extent of sea ice has been declining, and we reached um, a record minimum in August that has been announced you know, to the press back in August. We don't yet know the September monthly average because we still have a couple of you know, days, uh, a week and a half left in September. But if we look at what happened just recently with the seasonal cycle, this gives you a better context for the recent change. Okay, so here's the long-term average here. From 1970, here's the, the legend from 1979 to 2000, and the gray area shows the envelope of, of kind of what the, the variations had been through that time period. The 2007 minimum that, that was our previous low to date, um, you can show here, in, you can see here in the green dashed line, and the, the tracking for 2012 is shown here in blue. Right here is the, is the long-term average minimum for um, September, uh, for the daily minimum, and that is 6.7 million square kilometers. And the National Snow and Ice Data Center said that they think that we might have reached the minimum on su Sunday, which would have been 3.4 million square kilometers. They cautioned that it's possible that the winds could still compact the ice, so we could still hit a, 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 even a smaller extent. But it looked like that we might be sort of reversing the trend, and we would expect to see ice start to grow at about this time. 
So um, I, talked, I mentioned that I would also talk about thickness. And um, when people talk about the ice extent, that's you know, how big of a region is the ice covering. The other thing that's really important is how thick the ice is. So I'm, I'm 1.7 meters tall. <laughs> and when I first started working on the ice, it was about um, three meters thick, okay? So it was about twice my height, or close to twice uh, the, the thickness of this room. And the reason for this is that old ice, as it grows, it, you keep adding ice from the underside, and so ice thickens as it gets older. And also you have ridging, as you can see in these two pictures here. Younger ice is thinner, and basically the, my, my height now is 1.7 meters, and that's kind of the, the thickness of, of the ice that you're seeing up there now. And the reason for this is in part that we lost the very old ice. So what I'm going to show next is an animation showing ice age as a proxy for thickness, because it's, it's harder to measure the thickness of the ice because you have the underside that you have to worry about. But you can, you can, you can develop um, a way to, to estimate ice age. So a huge part of the central part of the Arctic used to be five years old uh, ice. And it's been increased, it's been diminishing and diminishing. And the reason for this is in part um, the warming, but it's also in part uh, changes in the dynamics. So when you have certain wind patterns, you blow a lot of the old ice out through this one passageway right here called Fram Strait. So you have to get the winds aligned just right to blow the old ice out. Right here is this region where the old ice is accumulating. The basic reason for this is that the winds are blowing the ice across the Arctic and it's piling up here. So this is what it has looked like, and if we take a look about at what it is like this year, you can see the same kind of pattern. So this is the extent, it's got a different color scheme, but this is the old ice is yellow and white, uh, fourth year ice and fifth year ice, and you can see that there's only a narrow band of old ice, even in March, and by late August, you can see it compressed up against the northern flank of Canada and the Greenland ar archipelago. Now this is important because old ice is more resistant to melting. Young ice is thinner, it's easier to disperse, it's easier to break up, and it's easier to melt. The old ice is like an old snowbank, you know, at the end of the spring, it can last for a really long time. So this distribution of old ice backing up against uh, the archipelago here is interesting for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons, okay, so I'll just go to the future. So one of the reasons is it, it plays into how fast we could lose the ice. So a lot of people talk about a seasonally ice-free Arctic where the ice would totally disappear in the summertime. Um, and other people talk about, some, they say, an almost ice-free Arctic. And there's, it sounds like a nuance, but it's actually really important in terms of habitat. So Strove et al. came out with a, a, a nice paper in August where they talked about the projections for the future, and they talk about a seasonally ice-free Arctic Ocean within the next few decades. But as you'll see, there's, there's a context to this that I'll give you in the next slide. More recently, um, a colleague of ours ha has said that potentially within the next four years, we could also lose the Arctic ice. Now, if we take a look at the Strove et al. model in this, this um, image here, which I know is somewhat busy, but you can see in red the actual observations, and then you can see the modeled projections running out to the year 2100. And what, what's interesting about these is that the, the, um, the observations are kind of in the middle right here, but a lot of the projections show that there should be a fairly steep decline around mid-century, and then that it should kind of plateau out. And I want to draw your attention to, to this plateauing. So right here, most of the models say that although much of the summer ice is lost, not all of the summer ice is lost, and they talk about less than one million square kilometers, um, but it, there could be some ice retained for quite a long period of time. Now, where will this ice be? If it was distributed all over the Arctic, then it would be really hard for, for it to form habitat, viable habitat for ice-associated species. But if it's collected into one area, and it's pretty reliable that every year you're, re, you're retaining the ice in that one area, then that becomes more interesting. And that's exactly what we see. So if we look at models, the spatial distribution of ice in models, it tends to persist longest during the summertime in this one region here, north of Canada and Greenland, where we see the oldest ice right now for the same reasons. Basically, the winds are, and the currents are blowing the ice, uh, transporting the ice across the Arctic into this region. Um, there was a really neat paper by, um, by Derner from the USGS where they projected polar bear habitat extent and changes in it by mid-century as well. And what they also show is that in this one region here, north of Canada and Greenland, we could retain some polar bear habitat. But you can see around the rest of the Arctic, you would be losing a lot of the polar bear habitat. 
So what we're working on now is to try to understand what these changes might mean uh, for the Earth Institute. And I'll just give, there's a lot of individual research that's going on on different components, and I'll just give two examples of some things that we're, we're um, planning and that we're doing that can give you an idea of how we're combining these in, in interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary ways. So the first one is um, what we're calling potentially a half the ice workshop proposal that, that, that's being circulated. Um, we're working with this on this with Rafe Pomerantz, with uh, Walt Meyer and some others, um, and other colleagues. And the idea would be to think about, you know, what are the projections of future, future Arctic sea ice given different emission scenarios? What are the sea ice management options? For example, this area here, north of Canada and Greenland, could that be managed um, somewhat as a refuge where you take a look at the ice that's feeding into that area and you try to maintain the quality of that ice so that you can preserve or maintain um, high quality habitat for decades into the future? What about ice, sea ice restoration op options? You know, how, how could we manage carbon to, to um, cool off um, the Arctic um, and to, or the, the globe, but the Arctic to try to restore sea ice? What are the timescales of that? And then what is some policy and practice guidance? Um, we also just recently got a, um, an award from the National Science Foundation for a polar learning and responding climate education partnership. And what we're doing with that is we're developing um, games and game-like resources and simulations and animations that will engage the public in understanding the changes in the, syst in the Arctic system and also in the Antarctic system. And we, we had a, a planning grant for this and now we're going to be um, actually um, doing the implementation over the next five years. And to give you an exa some examples of what we're doing with that, we have two, um, two games that I, I, I'll just mention here briefly because um, I think this audience might, might be interested in them. One of them is an Arctic future card game. So you actually build an ecosystem, you know, you get dealt cards and you have to build an ecosystem as best you can. And then you have to deal with environment and um, development stress, including sea ice loss. And you see how that affects your ecosystem over time. And it, it's, a, it's a really interesting one because many of the, the scenarios that Peter and others will be talking about actually play out during the game. Um, the second one we're, we're tentatively calling Arctic Smartic. We have an Antarctic version of both of these games in development as well. But in this case, you role play as stakeholders and um, we'll be talking about some of the stakeholders here during um, this panel and Ben Orlov and Peter are both working with us on this project as well as several other people in the room. Then you do marine spatial planning where you actually stake claims um, in the Arctic. And it's really interesting because much of the discussion about staking the claims really mimics what's going on when you, you read the papers today. And then you have to deal with environment and development uh, crises as well. And, and it's really interesting to see how different groups deal with different, um, different aspects of the environmental changes in the Arctic. And so we think these are two ways that really can engage the public in understanding more about the ramifications of sea ice loss on the Arctic system. Thank you. So our next speaker will be P uh, Peter Schlosser and he'll be talking about pan-Arctic environmental change. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> so what I would like to do is to talk a bit about the Arctic as a system and, and show, you, you know, bring across to you that the sea ice extent or the, the uh, decline in the sea ice extent is not an isolated phenomenon, but that there are many other things going on in the Arctic and uh, give you a feeling for how they are hanging together. So if we are thinking about the Arctic, a lot, a lot of people sort of think still about the Arctic as a place that is uh, pristine, remote, <coughs> exotic, they think about uh, you know, wildlife like polar bears that, that are unique to this area. But in a way, a lot of the, the reasons that we are interested in it, looking at uh, the um, you know, global environment, is that it is actually an integral part of the Earth system. And if you, if you look at, at this map, you know, it's, it's the, the oceans are connected, all those through uh, straits. And uh, of course, the, the land masses are reaching all the way up. There are no real barriers. So this uh, artificial separation sometimes is is uh, is not always helping in our in our thought process about how to integrate what happens there with what happens uh, on a global scale. And that, of course, was recognized uh, long ago. And in 2001, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had a statement in their report uh, that because of a variety of 
positive feedback mechanisms, the Arctic is likely to respond rapidly and more severely than other areas uh, on, on Earth, with consequent effects on sea ice, permafrost, and hydrology. So although at that time, the effects of global warming, climate change, other environmental change, and, and human drivers were not that visible, it, it was recognized that this should be the area where some of the consequences of, of uh, our activities will show up first and with high amplitudes. And of course then in 2007, as in any of the previous reports, the IPCC projections showed that there is polar amplification, both on the southern and the northern pole, but stronger uh, in the Arctic. In the Arctic. So what, what are some of these changes? Uh, let's just have a look at uh, you know, what, what we are seeing and um, how these things might, might actually hang together. So during the past decades, we did see a reducing sea ice cover, as Stephanie said, mainly in summer. But also the winter extent is contracting a little bit, or with, with less consequences than the, uh, the summer one. We have warmer waters pushing into the Arctic, delivering heat from lower latitudes. There is an increased air temperature over most of the Arctic, not, not everywhere, but most of it. There's a warming of permafrost, melting of Greenland ice sheets, and you know, I, could, I could add uh, more uh, effects to that. But these are some of the typical ones. These physical changes have impacts on ecosystems and society. And what we are seeing is really a, a combination of natural variability and change and anthropogenically driven change. And it happens on many timescales, seasonal to interannual to decadal and centennial. And we are sort of just in the, in the middle of that now. We have time series that reach about uh, four decades back. And one thing that we hopefully will get to in, in our presentations, but also in the discussion, is what to do about it, how to respond to these changes. And we will see that at this point, we cannot really mitigate it anymore, uh, or not only mitigate it, we, we also have to deal with the fact that we have to start to adapt to these changes. So let's look at some of the things that I have mentioned in a more graphical way. This is the air temperature anomaly over the um, Arctic, and it's here on an annual basis and, and here for, for the winter. And if you look at the, the colors, the, the more red you have, the, the higher the anomaly is. And you, you can actually see that the, the biggest effect is happening in winter. If we are looking at how much uh, warming we have experienced during the past decades, if we are sort of just going into the middle of this uh, area and project it, it's, it's roughly two degrees Celsius, especially if we combine these two. So that is, if we recall that the global uh, increase of temperature is about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 degrees Celsius, we have this typical amplification factor that was uh, projected and, and observed for the Arctic of about two to two and a half. So there is uh, you know, an, an effect from above on the sea ice. If we are looking from the ocean, and this is a bit of a busy picture, but I will guide you through it, and we look at different places like here at the entrance of the Arctic Ocean for Atlantic water that's warmer than what is in the Arctic. Over here where the water has already made it halfway into the Arctic. And then here at the exit. And we are looking at uh, 2003, 4, 5, 6. Uh, in this area, we do see that the uh, colors are changing from yellow to purple, which is getting warmer. But also that the layer that is warm is thicker and it's moving somewhat closer to the, to the sea ice. So a lot of uh, our colleagues feel that not only are we putting some pressure on the sea ice cover from above through higher air temperatures, but also from below by delivering more heat underneath the ice and bringing it closer to the, uh, to the sea ice cover. Now, what does that do for the uh, uh, sea ice? Stephanie already has shown some of these, so I thought you know, I, A, I will be quick with them, with these pictures, but also it's actually, given the, the context, it's not a bad thing to see some of them twice. 
Let's look at this one here. The last six years, we had the, the six lowest sea ice extents in summer. So from 2007 through 2012, all the, the, minima, uh, the minima fall into that box. And that is a remarkable persistence of low sea ice uh, concentrations, at the, uh, sea ice extents at the end of, of summer compared to what the 79 to 2000 average was, which is that uh, gray line. And it's distinctly offset from that now. We have seen this figure, which is the average for, for August. And the question is now, you know, what does a that trend line mean? It's about 10 to, to 12 percent per decade of, of a decrease in the sea ice extent. That, that's a, a pretty steep decline and uh, clearly it cannot go on linearly for too much longer uh, before we hit uh, sea ice uh, free conditions in, uh, in summer. But what is the cause of all that? Now th there is a, a general trend towards lower sea ice extent due to global warming but particularly here in 2012 we didn't really have, like we had in 2007, particularly high temperatures over the sea ice. We didn't have wind conditions averaged over the summer that were anomalously uh, in the sense of, of uh, removing sea ice towards the straits where it can exit. What we had was a storm system at the beginning of August that was a very strong storm system that broke up quite a bit of the sea ice and thus enabled these smaller flows to, to flow away from the pack and melt faster. What that shows is that the sea ice cover is more vulnerable, and, and Stephanie mentioned that by saying it's thinner, and uh, the extent is smaller in summer, and that then in turn means that single events can lead to, to large effects now. So you, you can, from year to year, you can have large swings, and you can, under unfavorable circumstances for the sea ice, you can remove big chunks of it. I think the, the difference between the last uh, minimum and this minimum is the area equivalent of the state of Texas. So this here is the, the figure that was just uh, released on the NSIDC, National Snow and Ice Data Center, this afternoon. And this gray here, together with the, with the green, is the area that was uh, the 2007 sea ice extent, and here the lighter uh, gray and white is what we have in, uh, in, in uh, what we have this year. So these parts here have been removed, and some around here, some here, and this uh, has been left compared to 2007. Um, with respect to model projections, we are actually moving significantly below the envelope of the, of the models that project sea ice uh, retreat or the, the retreat in the extent. And, you know, we, we don't really know how that uh, continues, if it stays convergent or if it will uh, move closer together. The, the point is that what has been projected a long time ago and has been sort of met a lot of skeptics saying, what are these models really worth? Can they really tell you something? It, it, sh it shows that the models actually were pretty close to what we are observing. In fact, they were somewhat on the conservative side, and the observations turn out uh, to indicate a more rapid uh, de de uh, decrease of the sea ice extent. And then one final point on the, on the sea ice. Um, this is uh, from Holland and, and others in 2006. The projections based on models do show that this, as you would expect from a natural system, that this retreat is not a smooth one, but that once in a while you, you hit uh, abrupt changes or you hit areas where there are slight plateaus. And uh, that, that is something that we easily can see or could see and, and experience in the, for, in the coming years because the sea ice cover is so vulnerable and we just need small triggers that could come from different um, directions to remove big chunks of the uh, still existing sea ice. So another um, phenomenon that we are seeing, and there are people in the audience who study that intensively as part of their career, is the evolution of the Greenland ice sheet. 
Now, the, the sea ice, as much as there are consequences from removing it for the radiation balance, it doesn't do anything for the sea level. That is sometimes confusing to people. It's already in the water, it's swimming, so if you would remove all the, if you would melt all the sea ice, it would do nothing for the, for the sea level. But Greenland, of course, if we are losing mass of Greenland, turning uh, solid uh, water into liquid, it goes into the ocean and it will increase uh, the sea level. And here again, we have a long-term trend of larger areas of the surface of the Greenland ice sheet melting in summer. And this year we had an anomaly in, uh, I think it was between, between July 8 and 12, where for a few days the entire surface of uh, the Greenland ice sheet was uh, undergoing melting. And that is the first time that that happened in the 30-year satellite and other observation record. So, you know, you might say this was a very short single event and doesn't really have a big effect, but what it does indicate is that um, we, we are seeing these kind of, of effects in different parts of the system. They are not popping up in the same part of the, of the Arctic uh, system each year at the same place, but the uh, frequency with which they, they are seen is increasing. An interesting part of the Greenland ice sheet is that if you are looking at the surface and look at the meltwater, it can actually puddle and, and, and find its way into crevices and then it pretty much can develop into, in essence, a waterfall that makes it through the crevice and some of it actually hits the, the grounding line and makes it out into the ocean. And this interaction is probably the most interesting and there are people at Le Monde, including Robin Bell, who is sitting here, who are you know, putting their attention to that to see what kind of non-linearities are hidden in that and how that actually might accelerate the uh, removal of ice from, from Greenland. The glacier mass balance, another indicator of um, how stable the cryosphere is in, in high uh, northern latitudes, shows a steady decline since uh, 2000. And if you would go back, there, there is a further decline, but I just took this uh, figure to illustrate how that uh, presents itself. We're looking at permafrost, one of the uh, signature features of high uh, latitudes. We do see a warming of permafrost. This is a time series uh, measured by Vladimir Romanowski from uh, University of uh, Alaska and Fairbanks that shows that over the years uh, there is a general trend uh, to warming and some of it is actually thawing. And then there is a simulation that shows that as the years go on, these pink areas is where we have high temperatures, that this is moving northward. This is for the coming century. So it starts in the middle of, last, of the last century and goes uh, to about 2050 or so. And you can see this area moving, moving northward. And what that does is it can change your surface significantly and the hydrology that's connected with it from one that's pretty wide and frozen to something that has uh, actually uh, hydrological features like rivers and small lakes and uh, vegetation that can develop around it. That then leads us to vegetation zones. Uh, according to projections that were done as part of the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, uh, we will have an increase in vegetation uh, from this sort of uh, heterogeneous pattern land cover pattern to one that is uh, pretty uh, green, pretty much covered by vegetation during the, the coming uh, century. And then what, what some people call uh, the greening of the Arctic uh, is, is shown here, also a shift in vegetation zones. So in, in many areas where you have this uh, greening, it means that uh, the, the Arctic is uh, getting more shrubby, um, that uh, the vegetation zones are moving north and thereby uh, show a higher productivity. And these brown areas are stands of uh, mature forest that uh, cannot take up any more uh, carbon. So if we put all that uh, together now, um, there, there was a, a meeting of uh, people who looked at different parts of the Arctic in 2003, and they, they were sort of looking at what is really happening in all these subsystems and how does it go together. And uh, 
don't don't try to understand all these arrows. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the the message in these pictures is that the only scenario that uh, they could come up with was to say that as we are moving forward, we are losing a lot of the negative feedbacks and that the Arctic is moving from a system that has many components that are closely interacting with each other to one that has less components by removing some of the sea ice, some of the land ice and so on and so forth. And that they, there was a conclusion that the Arctic is on a, a, a trajectory to a new seasonally ice-free state. And all that seems to really play out now and we, we get uh, more and more indications of how that actually might happen. <coughs> We will hear more about impacts uh, from Anne, but I just wanted to, you know, just show you where they are. They are in, in the, in the uh, sea routes, they are in the infrastructure along the coasts. Uh, they are actually in sea level in lower latitudes if we are looking at uh, Greenland as part of the Arctic system. And that's how these things look. Uh, so you, you really have, uh, you know, infrastructure um, that literally falls uh, off the cliff. Now. We are actually, there is a lot of coverage of that. The question is, and I think Ben will talk about that, are we really getting the message across? And, and does it have any impact? Um, you can look from scientific uh, publications to, to uh, you know, publications in magazines uh, across a wide spectrum. There, there, there is coverage of these uh, topics. And in fact, in the New York Times, there was uh, in 2004, in November, I think it was, was uh, an, an article that sort of was provocative and said the future of the Arctic might actually depend on our ability to imagine and purposefully shape its future, sort of hinting towards Earth engineering options and things like that. And the question, and I'm looking forward to Ben's uh, comments on that, is how well is that actually resonating and, and what are the, uh, the consequences? Now in terms of, of science and scientific programs, what are we actually doing about that? Uh, Stephanie already mentioned there is a study of environmental Arctic change. It's an interagency study in the United States. It has an international counterpart, the International Study of Arctic Change, that looks at the nature, extent, and future development of these changes and uh, tries to come up with uh, options of how to respond to them. And uh, one part of, of this effort is to take observations that allow us, among other things, to look at the sea ice extent or the evolution of the, of the oceans and the atmosphere. And again, bringing it back to what people are doing here at Columbia, there is uh, one piece of this ocean observing system, and there are atmospheric observing systems, there are ice observing systems and so on, that uh, is done out of here. And there, there are flights each year from alert towards the North Pole, where uh, a plane is landed on the ice, on the sea ice, every degree is north and holes are drilled through the ice and packages are lowered that allow us to measure temperature, salinity and, and collect water samples. And one part of that program is one goal is to understand the freshwater components and, and when and how do we see the impact of melting ice or increased river runoff or precipitation minus evaporation. So to, to just summarize quickly, um, it, it's clear that human activities are putting many pressures on, on our planet. The uh, impacts on individual subsystems are highly interconnected. Typically, there are non-linear uh, interactions between them. These effects are more and more visible. Sea ice uh, extent is one of them, but there are many other things in lower latitudes that are showing up more clearly and more frequently. Adaptation of our natural systems is already underway. And, um, but the design, deliberate design of adaptation strategies by society is slow and I think it cannot keep pace with uh, anthropogenically driven change. And if we are looking at mitigation efforts, they are of course partially paralyzed by the challenge of reaching uh, global agreements and uh, again I, I hope I will learn from, from Ben what we can do there, but uh, one alternative of course would be to instead of going uh, top down to move more bottom up and use uh, local and regional approaches uh, that then sum up to a, a global effect. Thank you. So uh, Anne will now talk about some of the implications of what we are seeing here. Thanks. I'm going to talk a bit about 
what this all means in terms of development in the Arctic and operations up there, both in, of course, what everyone really cares about is oil and when will the oil spill, um, but also search and rescue and other issues. Before I begin, I should give the standard disclaimer that up until last month, I worked for the US Navy. Everything I say is my own opinion and not the fault of our government. <laughs> okay, credit, whatever. <laughs> Um, all right, so I started here with a picture of the Perry expedition to the North Pole because I think it's important to recognize that some of the challenges to operating in the Arctic are and have been the same for a very, very long time. It's cold, it's dark, there are storms, and you're isolated. So all of these issues are going to remain issues. Yes, they will be less issues with the sea ice melting, but as Stephanie pointed out, there will still be winter ice up there. It's still going to be dark. Some of these places you're talking two, three, four hours of daylight at best in some of these operating hours. So consider doing whatever you need to do in the dark, in the cold, in the middle of a storm. Okay, so with the sea ice melting, we are expecting quite a bit of development. The big question is not, will Arctic development happen? It's when, how, and what are we gonna do about it? So specifically looking at what kinds of things might happen, commercial shipping, tourism, fishing, oil and gas development, infrastructure developments. To keep this presentation brief, I'm just going to touch momentarily on tourism and fishing in particular. Tourism, we're really talking about cruise ships here. Uh, we've already had cruise ships run aground in the Arctic and already had problems getting up there and rescuing people. Uh, Canada had the MV Clipper Adventurer run aground in Arctic waters. Took two days to get an icebreaker up there to rescue the 128 people on board. That was in summer, in the best conditions possible. We'll discuss a bit why that was a best case scenario and it still wasn't very good. Looking at fishing, the oceans are changing as well as the atmosphere as well as the land. So when there are the best predictions seem to suggest that fish are actually going to move north into Arctic waters, suggesting that there will be more fishing. And if sea ice is melting and conditions are improving, fishermen can operate for longer periods of time in the Arctic, which means they'll be taking more fish out of that ecosystem, raising questions about what that means in terms of that ecosystem survivability, and also raising questions about how will they transport that fish out of there? Where are they gonna be ported? Where are they gonna be operating? What regulations are we gonna put on that? Um, infrastructure. The three biggest towns in the Arctic are all in Russia. Traditionally, they've been ice bound, but with melting sea ice, they're not gonna be ice bound as often for as long. So the question is, will they grow? They're gonna be able to get resources in and resources out suggesting that this population is going to grow, that they're gonna build bigger cities. Russia's already putting a lot of money into development, as we'll discuss, um, and building more things up in that area. How do these all feed into each other? So, start with shipping routes. I just wanna mention that these kind of developments are all about a trade-off between the temptation and the risk that you take by trying to reach for that. The temptation of going through the Arctic shipping routes in the Northwest Passage or the Northern Sea Route particularly the Northern Sea Route, 4,000 miles cut off of your tr shipping transit time versus going through the Suez Canal. It's 4,000 miles that you don't have to pay for oil, you don't have to pay salaries for your seamen, you get your goods there that much faster, and you don't have to go through the Arabian Sea, which is currently pirates. So that's a temptation. What I want to talk about for a moment are the dangers and the expenses that are preventing that from escalating as quickly as sometimes people think it will. It is escalating. A Canadian estimate says from 1906 to 2006, the Northwest Passage had 69 ships go through that passage. In 2011, it had 22 ships alone. So the increase there is exponential. However, in absolute numbers, 22 ships, not that dramatic in terms of how many ships we're actually talking about. Some of the reasons we're not seeing ships go through there as quickly. Ice flows. Uh, Stephanie mentioned that young ice breaks up. It breaks up and it can float into transit routes, which means danger for ships, ships that aren't reinforced. If they are reinforced hulls, that's an expense, that's an expensive design, and that's an expensive ship to maneuver. It's also heavier and costs more money in terms of fueling it to run, taking down some of the temptation of taking this shorter route. If you have to hire an icebreaker to go with your ship, that adds money into it, why you would have to run that fuel. For those of you who remember Nome, Alaska needing to be refueled, we had to find a Russian tanker that had reinforced steel sides and we had to send an icebreaker with it because the reinforced steel was not enough to get through that ice. If you have to have an accompaniment, it gets that much more expensive. In terms of navigation, there are estimates out there that perhaps only 10% of the Canadian Arctic waters have been mapped to modern standards. 10%. Um, 
So when you're looking at the kind of navigation that you're doing, the kind of communications you have up there, realizing you have very little infrastructure, very little granularity in your maps, those are real risks. That cruise ship that ran aground, ran aground, it claims, it actually sued the Canadian Coast Guard for not updating its maps of the area. The Coast Guard sued it back, so who knows. But, but these are real issues in terms of navigational risks that you run up there. Poor infrastructure I'll discuss a little bit more, but if something goes wrong, you're on your own, and you're a thousand miles or more from the nearest help. So you'd better be able to be okay on your own for a good period of time. All right. Um, what everyone cares about, oil and gas, right? This is the temptation. 90 billion barrels of oil, 44 billion barrels of natural gas liquids. You can read those numbers. The thing I'd like to compare to is U.S. proven oil reserves are estimated at 25.2 billion barrels. So compare that to the 90 billion barrels of oil in the Arctic, and you can see why people want to get up there and why they want to do that drilling. Um, for those following the news of the Shell oil exploration, the problems that Shell is facing right now are perfect examples of the kinds of problems every oil company is going to face up there. Do we expect oil companies to move into the Arctic and drill? Yes. Do we expect them to do it tomorrow? No. Why? Because it's expensive. When you put up something in the Arctic, you have to pay extra money to get people to go up there because it's cold and it's dark and they don't want to be far, far away. You have to put in extra infrastructure because cities don't exist up there. There aren't hotel rooms that you just rent for your workers who are coming in for three months in the summer. There isn't a plane route. Shell is actually planning to run its own, very own daily plane route to bring workers in and out. That's a huge expense. Shell's already put $4.5 billion into its offshore Arctic expedition since 2005. It's one-sixth of its annual capital spending budget. That's a huge amount to put on a venture that you hope will pay off. BP put in $1.5 billion and then drew out saying it's too expensive. It's too pricey. Oil, we need the price of gasoline to go up, <laughs> if you can believe it, in order to drive us into the Arctic to do more exploration. Um, that said, people are going into the Arctic and they are exploring. Norway is planning to open up 72 new exploration areas in its North Arctic, Arctic Barents Sea. So there will be more drilling in the area. It just depends on which ones have been proven fields and which ones haven't and what those particular regulations in those areas are. Um, Russia is planning to expand, as I mentioned. Their Siberian population is 1.5% of the Russian population, but already produces 11% of their GDP. Here's an area that contains millions of barrels of oil, natural gases, and with permafrost melting, has easier access to some of the onshore natural resources that they're already famous for. Uh, they're expecting significant increase in that area, which is one of the reasons Russia is putting so much investment into their Arctic development. Um, so, problems. If we put more people up in the Arctic and we put more oil and natural gas drilling in the Arctic, we're going to have something happen. The question is, what can go wrong and what do we do about it? I want to point out something here that's uh, obvious but sometimes overlooked, which is just that Alaska and the Arctic, they're really, really big. Alaska is 34,000 miles of shoreline. That's twice the amount of shoreline of the 48 states combined. So when you talk about the amount of shoreline that we need to protect and that the Coast Guard would have to monitor, that's a huge investment and that's a huge area. That line right there is 1,000 miles. From the tip point of Alaska down to Juneau is 1,000 miles. It's the same distance for those of you who commute from New York to Orlando. So that same amount of difference is what we're talking about when we talk about these areas. This is something I think we need to keep in mind when we're talking about how easy it is to do things up in that area. I'd also like to point out this quote from Commandant U.S. Coast Guard Robert Papp, which just says, right now we have zero capability to respond in the Arctic. Uh, this was in a quote from congressional testimony. Um, clearly he's, on the one hand, wants to, wants to express the need for the Coast Guard to have more resources in order to operate up in this area. But it is also, I think, a chilling statement of his assessment of our ability to respond in the Arctic and something we do need to keep in mind. Um, are we planning for disasters today, tomorrow? No, but we do need to be planning for disasters in the future. The lack of infrastructure, how empty it is up in the area, is something I want to point out. Those maroon dots you see on the southern coast of Alaska are the Coast Guard stations. Note that they're not 
on the northern part of Alaska in the Arctic, uh, or what some places are calling the Arctic. The green, slightly green open circle is where Nome, Alaska is, where we had to get people in to help it. The blue dot is the northernmost deep water point in the United States. So when we send up any big ship, that's as far north as it can go at the moment. It can't get any closer to that. And from there to the pink circle is 1,000 miles. So 1,000 miles away is the closest U.S. Coast Guard air base station, deep water port, and support for things up in the north. Pink Circle is Barrow, Alaska, where Coast Guard operations have just start, stood up a temporary base and put new helicopters in. This is a fun description of the isolation of northern Alaska. Barrow, Alaska is 4,000 people. There's a fun discussion between Commandant Pap and congressional testimony he was giving when he says, do you know how many hotel rooms there are in Barrow? Think about the response we sent down to the Deepwater Horizon spill. Right? Thousands, thousands of people from all over the world down into the Gulf. If they have to go up there, where do they sleep? Now this sounds like a foolish question, but it's a very serious one. Where do you put these people? If they have to bring in their own ships, their own ports, their own docks, their own housing, this is a significant issue. So you know, the answer, of course, is that there aren't that many, and what do we do? The Coast Guard base up there went up this summer to put helicopters in Barrow and released an interesting story in which it arrived in town and found that there was exactly one helicopter hangar for rent. Uh, and the helicopter hangar is sinking into the permafrost at the moment. So if they intend to stay, they're gonna have to do some investment in that infrastructure. And that requires a consideration on what that looks like. Do we want it to be helicopters? Do we need it to be a deep water port? There have been discussions of putting another deep water port in Alaska. Where does it go? Where do we think it will be ice free? Where do we think it will benefit these trade routes? Um, in terms of discussing and spill, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation Enforcement produced an EIS study on one of their leases in the Chukchi Sea and suggested that there might be a 20% chance for a large oil spill over the life of the lease, 21 years. A 20% chance is not huge, and this is assuming that there actually is oil production on that lease, which they say is under a 10% chance, still. If oil production is actually up there, we're looking at a 20% chance of more than 1,000 barrels of oil being released into the ocean. This is not as low of a chance as I would feel comfortable with, knowing how far away our response team is. The lines, I should point out on this, are a good sign. These are the International Agreement on Cooperation of Aeronautical and Maritime Search and Rescue in the Arctic. One of the international agreements based on the Arctic divided up the Arctic into these segments on the Arctic Council to enhance cooperation for search and rescue so that U.S. Coast Guard doesn't have to get all the way across. It only has to get in our sliver, which you can see there. Still, that's a significant distance considering the scale of this map. Oh yeah, I also wanted to point out that our icebreakers are currently homeported in Seattle, Washington. So getting icebreakers up north can be a challenge if they're not already stationed up there. Speaking of icebreakers, the Russian Arctic 2020 plan puts in $44 billion to build 20 Arctic bases, nine rescue centers, and enough icebreakers to bring its total to 25 or 26 icebreakers, depending on where we do our cutoff level on how heavy they are. The U.S. currently has two, one heavy and one medium. The one that's heavy is the Polar Star. It was built in 1976 retired in 2006 and then reactivated in 2010. Just to give you some idea of how, what its condition might be. Um, it has gotten some upgrades and is expected to stay in service until about 2020, which is when the Coast Guard hopes to bring a new icebreaker online. Uh, estimates suggest that the US Coast Guard would need about $3 billion to build the number of icebreakers it says it needs either about roughly about three heavy and three medium icebreakers, uh, depending on how they do that basing and manning power, in order to manage the Arctic. They were given eight million to run a study on what that icebreaker would look like um, in the most recent budget. So from three billion to eight million investing in there, considering Russia putting in 44 billion and Canada putting in 2.9 billion to, just in all-terrain vehicles. So. They're also building new icebreakers and have a number of icebreakers. You can see the relative position up there. Um, 
So one more thing on operating is that there are good news stories and we are learning about this and this is an issue that people are considering. It's not something, nothing I've told you is news. Everything I've said today is on Google, it's in the news, it's being considered by the Coast Guard, by the Navy, by other agencies. So everything here is being considered. The Navy did a 2011 Fleet Arctic Operations game to look at what it would be required if it actually wanted to go up and do sustained operations in the Arctic. Um, some of the things it suggested it would need are Arctic capable ships, reliable communications. As I mentioned, environmental data, maps, looking at the weather, predicting those, trained personnel, deep water ports. The Coast Guard is just finishing up its Arctic Shield 2012 exercise, where it brought up the Coast Guard cutter Sycamore uh, and did actually oil response practices, uh, exercises. One of the things it learned is that its cutter Sycamore had to be ported 650 miles away from where they wanted to do the exercise. So they had to get tugboats to tug it up to the area to do the exercise. So one of the big things that they learned is that if there's actual response up there, they need to have a different mechanism to deal with these areas that are so far away from deep ports. All right, and then also just wanted to discuss that these things in some ways are a feedback loop. More ships go up into the Arctic, so we need to put a Coast Guard base in Barrow. So more people live in Barrow. We have more flights to Barrow. So they need more resources. So we bring up more ships. So we have more presence in the Arctic. So we need more Coast Guard presence in the Arctic, and so on and so forth. If Shell drills, Shell needs to put its workers and have them live somewhere. It needs an airstrip for its 737 flight it's going to have daily. So it needs places to put them, and so on and so forth. So in some ways, this development is a, well, the phrase I've always heard is the self-licking ice cream cone. Right? It's the thing that feeds on itself and keeps going and keeps predicting its own success and own future here. So, In some ways, once this starts, there is going to be a continuation here. The question is, what are we going to do about it and how are we going to respond to that? And I think that's time for me to lead into Ben Orloff, who's going to discuss our perceptions of Arctic development and how we respond. So I'll be talking about the perceptions and very glad to be following the previous uh, three talks, I think, uh, you've covered quite a bit of material here. So I'll, I'll be addressing these three topics. One is just how do people perceive this area? We certainly import and we're discussing it, but how do we process information? It's something very different from what we ordinarily think about, so how do we understand these remote places? I want to emphasize that there are different segments of the public, different groups of people who are involved, and also want to talk about building public concern for the Arctic, that there are many different groups who are involved, different sectors, but we're hearing about very special, uh, relatively specialized groups um, of particular industries or transport. How did the the bulk of the American population, who are very much whose lives are connected with air, how do they become involved? So um, I want to say that when people receive information, they process it. Information always comes in some specific form. There's this wonderful book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Daniel Kahneman is not a relative; he's just someone whose work I admire. Uh, he really summarizes very clearly that people have different mechanisms for thinking, that we often admire the slow, reflective thinking that takes place, that scientists carry out, that you presume takes place in policy circles, but really people also form quick opinions and respond fairly immediately. And so there are these different mechanisms for responding to information, and however, we have to be selective in how they're presented. Um, there are different ways that people place attention. There are so many things that compete for our, our attention in the news and just our immediate environment that surrounds us. How do we choose between different things? And there are a lot of dimensions that people pay attention to. There's questions of whether things are in nearby places and times. Here we're talking a lot about distant places in the remote Arctic and we're talking about future that is uh, not tomorrow, but years, perhaps decades hence. And when we're talking, people often pay attention to things that are more concrete. And yet some of these ideas are relatively abstract. So psychologists who study perception look at these different dimensions to when you try to see how people respond. And we discover that people by and large uh, who are receiving information, who are watching television programs, seeing, uh, glancing at the newspaper, just uh, hearing, uh, perhaps they're hearing about the Arctic, but they would also be, there are many other topics that compete for their attention. Uh, people will pay attention to the things that are most immediate, the things that are taking place here, the things that are taking place now. 
uh, and people's attention is often grabbed by the things that are most concrete. You think more about specific objects rather than ideas. You think about polar bears rather than biodiversity. When you think about, you can think about numbers more than ratios. You can, if something is the smallest, that's going to mean more than a 49% loss. And people in particular pay attention to events more than processes. It's one thing to know that the Arctic ice is shrinking. It's very different to hear that there's an event, that something took place, that there's a new minimum. That's, uh, those are things that can grab people's attention. So when you want to communicate all these, uh, the, whether you're commu com communicating complex information, whether it, this is the complex scientific information that Stephanie and Peter were talking about or some of the complex uh, policy and economic issues that Anne was talking about, it's good to emphasize these dimensions, getting people to think about the Arctic with these ways. But it turns out that scientists actually often think about the exact opposite. Scientists are trying to understand both what's happening, bo both what's immediate and what's distant, thinking about recent time, but earlier times and future times. We're seeing slides from 1950 to 2050. Well, that's not as immediate as today. Looking at nearby and distant places, scientists want to integrate the entire planet. People want to know what's happening nearby. And scientists love all these abstractions, spend years training themselves to think about that, and that's what they communicate. So they talk about these abstract ideas, these complex ratios that integrate different variables rather than just focusing on specific numbers and looking at these broad processes, including some of these policy processes of feedback. So those are not so immediate. People don't grab, those don't grab people so much. So this is kind of a gap. You have the scientists, and that would include the policy scientists and the economists who produce the information. How can you communicate it in a way that lead people to understand? So I'll look at some examples here. Um, well, let's look at some point trends. Here's what here's the NASA news release um, from just uh, just not even a month ago. They talk about Arctic sea ice shrinking to new lows in the satellite era. So this is their headline. This is um, this is the um, this is NASA, a, a federal agency, one that broadly does science. These are scientists attempting to communicate to the to the public. Uh, so we have Arctic sea ice. Arctic sea ice is good. It's an object. It's something that people can understand. It's not, it's, you, people know where the Arctic is, they know where the sea is, and they certainly know about ice. And shrinking to new lows, that, to, to new low, that is good. Shrink is a strong verb. It's a very concrete verb. And a new low is, again, a simple event. You can get people to understand that. And, Shrinking, it's of course a very complex process. You've got these different sections of, uh, of the Arctic and to say that the Arctic sea ice is shrinking is summarizing, is simplifying a process. It's not one piece of ice that shrinks. It's actually the area that's calculated to have 15% or more cover. It's lots of pieces. It's multi-year. Good for them to simplify. And then uh, they say in the satellite era. And so you're thinking, okay, what is the satellite era? And that's it. The satellite era is us. NASA was created, I think, 22 minutes after Sputnik was launched. And so the satellite era is since 1958. It means a lot to NASA, and it doesn't mean beans to anyone else. <laughs> and this is scientists trying to communicate and doing a two-thirds of a job, so that's good for a scientist. Um, so there, you can look at these other headlines. The National uh, Snow and Ice Data Center, there are also a group of scientists there trying to communicate and doing a fairly good job Arctic sea ice breaks lowest extent on record. So that breaking is also good. We've got the same Arctic sea ice I like breaking, but the lowest extent on record, that I have to say is not quite so immediate. Like it's sort of harder to see what that happens. Not as good as shrinking, but it's better than um, this, which is okay, 4 million square kilometers sounds like a lot of square kilometers. <laughs> and you sort of have to, um, I, I'm a college professor, so I sort of know what a kilometer is, and I can, I'm pretty comfortable talking about kilometers. I've actually traveled to countries that use them, which is the rest of the world, ROW as we call it. <laughs> but square kilometers, I always have to try to remember how big they are and, so, and form, uh, okay. So it's, uh, th they're also, what they are doing is turning a trend into news, and that's good. They're creating it into events, but they're not communicating as effectively as they might. So let's, we can look at pictures, and you've seen these pictures before. 
this is a tremendously useful picture for scientists. And it, um, so you can see, uh, it, it, we certainly are very accustomed to thinking of time moving from left to right, and we can see this is broadly showing a lot of things going down, and what you have to notice is that this little point here is below this lowest point here. That was a news, and it's tremendously important. This picture communicates that very well to scientists, to the, to the science journalists who are here in the room, perhaps to some of you, and it's one important picture, but it's a picture that requires translation. That's my one point is that it, you can, what it's also showing is that these lines are mostly lower. The, the, there are some lines that are lower than other lines, and if you look at these, you can sort of work out that, these are, that this is also moving down as well as moving this way. Again, I'm not saying that these shouldn't be produced. They're not the sole form of communication. This is a better one because this, we've, you've seen this before, this shows the general downward trend and you can, you can grasp that there's something happening year to year and you can grasp that there's a trend. And so that's, uh, that's useful. That's good. It doesn't, um, that doesn't quite convey the newness. That just, that shows that there's a trend and that it's continuing and you're, it, it, it suggests it's about, so you don't quite know is this about to go off the charts here. This is a picture that I like better. I like that it's got a date on it, so that really makes it immediate. You want to know, and it's a recent date, you want to know what's happening. This is a picture. You, you can also see that this is Earth from space. We got that. That, I have to say, is one of the most powerful images. If I'm complaining about images that scientists have made, that the blue marble of the Earth as seen from space is such a powerful story of our uh, coherence and vulnerability. And this draws on that. And it, this also helps because you can recognize, um, <coughs> recognize North America. A lot of the maps of the Arctic Ocean um, are the first like 40 maps of the Arctic Ocean you look at are kind of puzzling because it's hard to imagine what Russia looks like upside down. You don't usually think about it. But the scientists have looked at many more than 40 of them, but the public hasn't. This at least is oriented for a North American audience. And this shows that it's shrinking, and I kind of like that you've got the edge of the ice. Problem here is that this is, this is a TMI, uh, too much information. Like what's happening here, some of this ice is outside, and here's this line here, but where's the line here? Mm -hmm. So this is showing, this is good that you've got the contrast of the reduction of the ice, but this story still doesn't quite punch it. You, it's a hard, it, the words are simple, but what do you do with it? And a visual image is stronger. Uh, they could be uh, more powerful, I think. So what I'm saying, at least I'm saying that the pictures are important, uh, that scientists and the public process information differently, and that it, you want to turn the process, the, this process of the Arctic sea ice loss into an event. There will be recurrent events, and that's a way of bringing this ongoing process to the public attention. So I just want to show that there are different segments of the public and that they respond differently. You've got uh, citizens overall and you've got policymakers. We'll have a few more slides here. So this is an image, I think, from uh, a, British, uh, a British magazine, The Guardian, and I think this is a really strong picture. This, there's a nice scale here. You can look at this and you, can, you see that the ice is breaking up. You can see both that ships can get through, but you can see they're vulnerable. I really like how compact this is, how much is going on in this picture, and I'll, uh, this uh, tells you this is an expedition that's documenting this. You can also see that there's, uh, this is Greenpeace going in there, and so this is, they're trying to convey that there are group, various groups that want to connect with the Arctic directly. And so here's um, another story. They have Arctic sea ice shrinks to smallest, smallest extent ever recorded. Ever recorded is really powerful. That's even better than new low ever gives a much longer time frame. And here's just a poignant picture of the a, a drop of water. And again, it shows how often less is more. You can see that one piece of ice's map is melting and it's that concreteness. It's something that's on a scale more commensurate with the the human body, in a way, one drop tells more than four million, uh, more than four million square kilometers. So this is also from the Guardian, a British newspaper, and here is from a Facebook page of a friend of mine in the Netherlands. And so here's this picture that just this friend happened to pick up. He doesn't know that I work on this, and uh, it's um, you can see some comments in Dutch, which if you 
If you forget that you don't know it, you actually do know it, that's pole ice, even if it doesn't look like pole ice. And this is Berg offwards, which is downhill, and he's saying that it's, everything's going downhill. So he's got a friend here um, who uh, is inserting a little German into his Dutch end site, saying we're really in the end time here. And I think you can get that here's someone who likes the actions of Greenpeace against Shell. So we're seeing that this gets picked up. Here's some social media. People are talking about it. How does that connect? Well, I want to, I have to say this is my very favorite picture, this New Yorker cover, which somehow manages, uh, although you wouldn't get the, uh, the sun's a little, isn't going to look quite like that. I, I like the way that you take the Arctic and turn it into a tropical island. This is, you expect these, these images to have someone on sand and a palm tree, and here's a very stunned uh, Santa Claus, who we know to be at the North Pole. And here's the New Yorker putting this out well in advance of the announcement. They knew that the trend was heading down, as everyone else did, but the scientists have to wait, and the New Yorker doesn't. Um, here, here is, um, just want to say that there's a lot else going on. So I want to talk about policymakers, a lot of other events here. Summer heat in the United States, which in some ways is connected to continental airflow that has some links to the storms that weaken the ice. Here's a drought monitor picture. This is showing, this shows both a long-term and short-term drought in the United States. This is really an exceptional year here as well. And then here are the sea ice, sea ice, sea ice loss images, and then here is Hurricane Isaac coming through. These are all events happening in late August. This is also the anniversary of Katrina. Here's Katrina, which uh, uh, seven years ago was coming through, uh, coming through a similar region, and Isaac was heading to exactly the same place. So here are policymakers in recent climate events, and this is an opportunity for one of our two major parties to discuss these events that were occurring in late August. So these are just, um, he here are these five, five weather and climate change related events, how tightly linked are the climate change hurricanes weekly, if at all. These are the questions of what kind of effect do they have on the Republican National Convention. Isaac sure had a strong effect because it delayed the start. There were representatives from the states that were having big declines in agricultural production. And there's a question of what kind of policy options are available. This is a very uh, sort of loose scale, but you can prepare for hurricanes. There's a lot that, there are many options that we see in the Arctic, and certainly there are many ways that we can adapt the U.S. to warmer summers and greater vari variability. And there's a question of how much attention there was to these. So I think the point here is that people pay attention to what's immediate and to what affects them. So it's really striking how much more attention there was to Hurricane Isaac, not connected particularly to climate change, than to the others. So there are, uh, again, the summary, different public response to vivid images. This concern could be short-lived. Uh, there were a lot, <coughs> there are events that happened. We had been worried about Y2K. We were worried about avian flu. And now we're worried about something new. We'll worry about other things as time changes. Policymakers similarly respond to short-term events. You'd, they hopefully have a longer time horizon, but they too are driven by immediate consequences, an upcoming election, uh, a new budget. So there, but the hope then, this is in fact not encouraging, but I think there are some signs of building concern. And it's certainly important to see that the Arctic, the public is aware of the Arctic. These kinds of images you've seen are the polar bear images. It's, uh, it really is striking with these iconic animals. Pol the, the Arctic has the polar bears, which are very cute and very vulnerable. And the Antarctica has even cuter penguins and they're perceived as not being vulnerable. And there's a history to that. And uh, here's a survey from a Yale project on climate change asking people, this is, these are well-conducted surveys, large samples of the American public, uh, just a lot of questions about what might global warming affect, asking about likelihood of melting ice caps and glaciers. Uh, three quarters of the American public understand that these changes are taking place. That has happened in a context where there are many other things not linked to climate change. And that, I would say, is a product of a history. There were, um, this is one of the earliest events. There were nuclear, there was a nuclear accident in Toole, Northern Greenland uh, in 1968, uh, depths of the Cold War. 
word got out at least to the US and Danish military that there were four missing nuclear weapons somewhere in northern Greenland. And they found three of them. They said, well, actually, maybe we only lost three of them. We <laughs> didn't quite count. And the people who live in that part of the world uh, didn't forget. So uh, that's connected to some of the early conferences of Inuit and other indigenous peoples in the Arctic, who certainly have a history there of thousands of years. They were am among the people, but not the only one, who were mobilizing around the ozone hole, the thinning of, uh, the, thinning of the ozone layer, ozone layer in the atmosphere that protects us from incoming radiation. Ozone hole is another one of those fantastic terms, tells two words that tell such a story, led to the Montreal Protocol, um, 1986. Uh, a poorly managed reactor in the Ukraine sends radiation into the Arctic, um, affects, uh, affects people that led, to, I think, to increased attention to pollution. There are, there are conventions that dealt with these. With the, with the, with the, we were able to change the coolants in our air conditioning that produced the ozone hole. That's the uh, protocol that took care of that. We were able to address some of the other chemicals that led to pollution in the Arctic. We took care of that. So how can we build on this? To these steps to manage the fragile Arctic environments. We can change what we put in our air conditioners, so we uh, have addressed uh, this problem pretty well, so we just have to change what we put in our fuel tanks. And um, there are certainly groups who are paying attention to this. Here's, uh, here's one group that's communicating on the question, a very uh, 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 group that tries to bridge the science policy communication gap. That's their specialty is climate communication, and they advance things. We do see attention to the Arctic. This is from New York Times a couple days ago. We we're hearing about shell oil. The story, I, I think, in the context of awareness that's promoted by events such as this new mini minimum, I think there's more public attention to what we're, do what we're doing up there, and the hope is that the prior histories of organization, of science communicating, scientists reaching the public, um, linking to policymakers that have led to some impressive uh, international accords that have improved conditions in the Arctic, can deal with his, these biggest threats. People care about these issues, and I think we can build public concern. So we'll now move to the discussion, question and answers. The speakers will take our places. Test one, two. Check, check. Okay. So, questions, comments from the audience? Yeah. Is there? Um, is there any move uh, making this area an international sanctuary rather than develop it? Do you do either of you want to take that one? I could say that there are uh, the eight countries that border on the Arctic have an organization called the Arctic Council. So there's certainly international coordination, specifically in the Arctic, and there are certainly reserves that are up there. Uh, but it's really quite different from Antarctica, where there is an international treaty that does set it aside uh, for peace, for science, um, with many strict limitations on exploration in the Antarctic, particularly on land, that's very different from the Arctic. It's an encouraging example, but I think we're quite far from protecting the Arctic the way we protect Antarctica. Um, oh, great. Thank you. Um, hi. Actually, Stephanie, your, one of your slides, I think it was the distribution of ice, it was showing um, around the coast of um, Russia and both, both Russia and Alaska, um, blue. Now, did that, am I to interpret that as being that it was ice free? And if it was ice free, does that mean it's iceberg free, uh, ice flow free? You know, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Do you remember which slide it was? Was that um, the one showing the ice distribution? Sea ice there was one sea ice distribution. And. You're talking about the current sea ice distribution this right. this um this summer. So right. Peter, maybe yeah. you should take yeah. that one. Well, in in summer now, we we do have areas of open water in 
the uh, Canadian basin, which is sort of, uh, you know, in uh, it is uh, around Alaska, the, the North Slope. But also this year, actually, the ice retreated off East Siberia quite a bit. And uh, so th there is actually open water. In terms of, is it completely ice-free? Are you not encountering any flow or something like that? I, I would be cautious. I think you always can have that. But to a large extent, the, uh, the, the areas that were shown in blue in, in uh, the Canadian basin and along the Siberian shelf, they, they were open water, they were navigable and uh, hardly any ice. So in future years, we're expecting to see quite a bit of variability. And Peter showed that if you looked at the 2007 minimum and then this minimum, they were similar but not exactly the same. And Anne talked about it as well with respect to shipping. So when the ice is broken up and it's thinner and, you know, it can become more mobile and be moving into new areas and be moving more quickly and, and things. So just because this year um, certain areas are free doesn't necessarily mean that next summer they would be free. Yeah, good, yeah, go ahead with the follow-up, right, yeah. Is, um, okay, so let's say that the, um, okay, so the, I guess the most uh, conservative predictions are what's being termed as ice-free by, you know, the next century. And I guess what I want to try to push a little bit is any sort of views on does that actually mean uh, free of icebergs, free of ice flows, and here I'm sort of getting to what that means in terms of um, risks for shipping, risks for development, if I can push it, and if not, that's... <laughs> yeah. well, well, I can talk a bit about risks for development, I guess. Um, there are a variety of predictions, as you've seen, the range on when exactly we're looking at ice-free. Uh, the Arctic doesn't have to be completely ice-free before some organizations at least are going to operate up there. But until we find areas that are consistently ice-free or predictably minimal ice, I don't think we're going to see massive amounts of development up there. Um, at least not in terms of shipping and oil development. Uh, Shell's oil corporate uh, efforts, their drilling had to stop because an ice flow was heading their way and if they you know if that interferes with their operations it's it's a uh, scandal so i think until we see some kind of predictability there won't be as much development there as perhaps we fear in terms of when that's going to happen i really think that's not my area on this panel <laughs> I, I might just add from kind of a cognitive or psychological perspective that you can hear the word ice free and that would mean that there are large areas with relatively little ice but that doesn't mean that you would find absolutely no pieces of ice so then we go back to talking about icebergs and ice flows and those sound pretty benign you can you can find them it's there's a lot of daylight you can go around them but some of them are huge and have a lot of momentum so it, it, it so i think there's a way in which people would like to have that word and would like to reduce uncertainty to zero and I think there will just be a lot of surprises. You could have um, periods with, with relatively little ice and small ice and it would seem that it was pretty much open ocean and yet, and yet there might still be occasional accidents and it's not really that there be accidents but as Anne pointed out mm -hmm. how enormously difficult they are in that remote area. Uh, my question is uh, for either uh, the first two speakers, uh, and that's a comparison of, of the changes in winter temperatures versus summer. And when the impression I had from the slide that was shown is that the winter, the change in, or the decrease in winter temperatures was much more dramatic than the annual average, which, by which I infer that the other seasons didn't change quite as much. And now, wouldn't summer warming be more significant in terms of uh, leading to ice loss and some of the sea ice loss and some of the other Arctic feedbacks, you know, that are hastening global warming? The, 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 the most intense warming of the air over the Arctic is actually in, in winter compared to the long-term averages. And the reason is that in summer, the temperature is close to uh, zero, and as long as you have sea ice, which we still have quite a bit, 
and uh, water that's close to the freezing point. It's like an ice bath that holds it pretty close to, to, the, to the freezing point. So close to zero centigrade. Centigrade, sorry, yeah. Uh, it's another one of these uh, odd units. Um, <laughs> close to the freezing point. Um, and so, so what, but what, what happens is, um, in a, you know, although we have more warming in, in uh, winter, there is enough in summer that it does eat into the sea ice extent. So that, that is what we are seeing, actually. Temperature is one, one part of the story. And then, as Stephanie pointed out, the ice motion that removed some of the thicker ice flows that now cannot grow back because of the slight warming in summer. That's the second one, and that, that interplay uh, led to a consistent uh, retreat of the sea ice over the past few decades. If, if I could ask to follow up, that might be, are there some interactions of extent and thickness so that even if you get ice cover on warmer, if the, win, the warmer winters are still cold enough to produce ice, but it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't form as thick first year ice as you would have in prior years? She, she agreed with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the, the question we're all wondering um, is how is this going to affect the distribution and price of um, ice cream? <laughs> no, no ser seriously. Um, <clears throat> I guess um, I'm really wondering about the regulatory gap. It seems to me that um, you have um, <clears throat> kind of a set of nations there and regions which are actually, um, and, and Dr. Orlov, maybe you have some answers to this. I know you study a lot of uh, native peoples um, <clears throat> in other places around the world. But I'm thinking about a lot of the, um, the Eskimo populations, native populations in northern Alaska and Canada, and I'm sure it's quite similar in Russia. And these people, of course, are traditionally uh, very poor, very resource dependent. And I can't imagine that this isn't going to be seen as a kind of a new gold rush of jobs, opportunity. You did it, of course, mention, but you know, really the, the talk of, the, uh, of, the, <coughs> of all of the um, <coughs> the national conventions has been jobs and we know that's a that's a big problem up in that area but how do we empower these communities to to really um, take responsibility for what development they might want to encourage and make sure that whatever does happen there is done in a way that is um, both ecologically and and socially just thanks well the uh, it's uh, there uh, it, it, these are complex answers but Questions, but uh, briefly, the uh, indigenous peoples, there's, uh, which includes certainly the Eskimo or Inuit, and then there are the Sami in, in Scandinavia and a, large, a variety of groups in Russia, uh, are permanent, uh, re have permanent repre represent, observe, representative status. I'm trying to, representative or observer status, but they have some permanent status in the Arctic Council. They weigh in, they lobby heavily. There's the uh, the Arctic Council produced an Arctic climate impact assessment that was a very broad look at climate change in the Arctic. And because of the presence of those groups, there were lots of discussions of impacts on employment, on health, on well-being. And so there certainly are some areas, and, and there's a lot of attention to their hunting areas and their traditional resource uh, extraction. But there, um, that's variable from country to country, certainly weaker in Russia than elsewhere. And there are many areas that are far from uh, indigenous settlements, and those presumably are areas where there'd be less indigenous oversight over uh, oil and gas and mineral exploration. Right, because the, um, the ice has been so extensive in the summertime, it, it's melting back so far now that you're exposing areas that have not traditionally been accessible in the past. And so things are, the landscape is, is literally changing before our eyes. What are the uh, implications of uh, melting sea ice for international law, international alliances, and diplomacy? Sure. I pretend to be a lawyer sometimes, so I'll, uh, I'll feel that. Um, there are some real challenges in terms of international law. Um, particularly, boundary disputes are not expected to become severe, but they are present up there. Uh, Canada, for example, asserts that the Northwest Passage is Canadian territory. The United States takes the position that it's international navigable waters. So there's a dispute there in terms of who can pass through that, what are the regulations, do we have to 
do we have to go abide by Canadian regulations or is there an international agreement there? Uh, there are all kinds of in issues in terms of how ships operate up there right now. The International Maritime Organization has guidelines for ships operating in the Arctic, but they're not binding. So they're just now coming out with binding guidelines for Arctic operations uh, that we hope will come forth. The Arctic Council is looking at doing an international agreement on pollution regulation. Um, we'll see if that's successful. Uh, but if it is, it would have significant ramifications for operations. Um, and I use operations loosely for shipping um, and other activities up in the Arctic. But I think right now the issue is that regulation is somewhat open and it's countries taking national positions and working together to try and find common ground that they can but it hasn't been satisfied yet. And with the United States not being part of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, it raises particular tricks for the U.S. in terms of our claims on areas in the Arctic Shelf and our interactions with our partners. So I think right now, in terms of what does it mean for it, it's still an open question. So it, it raises uh, this, this new landscape in the Arctic is, um, plays into this as well. So this area north of Canada and Greenland that we've been talking about as where the, the last remaining ice will be in the summer, maybe for decades into the future, the ice shed that's actually feeding that, so that the, the location of the ice will probably be largely within the Canadian and Greenlandic ex exclusive economic zones, but the ice that's feeding that, that's supplying that, is winter ice that's formed over the central part of the Arctic and potentially even as far away as Russia. And so that raises a lot of questions. You know, if you want to deal with this as a special area, then how, how can you, you'll have to involve, you know, it's got international aspects to it and distal um, country aspects to it as well. Just one I, quick point. Um, even, even if you think about the Arctic and uh, territorial um, issues without sea ice retreat, it's fairly tricky because, uh, the, you know, people are spending a lot of money on research into the so-called Lomonosov Ridge, uh, which is a uh, a, a, a geological structure, basically a, a, a mountain coming off the seafloor, fairly thin, that connects the East Siberian Shelf with Greenland. And depending on whether or not the, the quote-unquote verdict is that this comes off the East Siberian Shelf or off Greenland, the way the EECs will be mapped out will be very different. And, uh, you know, we could end up with a situation where a lot of the waters are Russian EEC, and that will not make the situation easier. Those are the economic exclusive zones or yes. the exclusive economic zones? I mean, <clears throat> sorry, concerning the law of the sea, it took about 15 or 20 years to finally get to the law of the sea, right? So it was a huge effort. And uh, fine, the United States is not part of it, but is any, is any part of the law of the sea relevant to all this problem? Assuming that the United States is part of it, okay, which is... Yes, uh, so the law of the sea right now is the main way that we govern how we establish exclusive economic zones and how we establish continental shelf and outer continental shelf uh, claims. Um, stop me if I'm going terribly wrong here. Um, so the so UNCLOS, the law of the sea treaty, is extremely important for settling disputes exactly like you just mentioned. Um, so because the United States is not party to UNCLOS, when Russia puts in a and says we claim everything or we claim this part or we claim this part or Canada says we claim this or we claim that, the United States can respond, but we're not a party at the table, so, mm -hmm. so that's nice, but... Well, this has is, this is a, a, a been raised several times, I think, as, as a major issue in terms of how we, how we interact with it. Um, it's, it's an, I think it is an issue in terms of how the United States has a seat at the table for some of these discussions, so... In terms of the reduction of the area that have permafrost, the word methane hasn't come up. <laughs> there is, of course, the question of how much methane will be released, both uh, from the shelf areas but also from, from lands. And I sidestep that because the numbers that you are getting at this point, you have some estimates, it's ranging so so widely that I wouldn't know which number to give you. I think this is in the middle of being investigated and I think that we just have to wait until we have a better estimate. There.
Uh, there was a motion, a mention of the measurement of the land area and the sea area. And I want to remind the audience, although they're a little too young to understand the laws of the United States, but in 1888, the Congress passed a law that made the metric system the standard for the United States. <laughs> now, it is a meter is a meter, and a meter is a mass, and a meter has a mass as opposed to the American system would give us certain scientific advantages. And it would also help the public to understand the science and the scientists to understand the public if we followed the rule of the law. The majority of the nations of the world use metric. Our neighbors use metric on the north and in the south. But here we're in the minority, and I think we ought to join, recommend as part of our motion at the meeting <laughs> that we join the nations of the world and go metric. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for a very entertaining and interesting. I'm very taken with Ben's comments about how we as scientists should be better communicating and how our ratios are terrible and our plots are indecipherable. It actually makes me think that Peter should be explaining changing sea ice in the Arctic by saying that, you know, 50 years ago, Lamont scientists went up for three to four months and camped in camps in the middle of the ice sheet. And the most recent thing that happened was Peter's group put a plane in to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean because they landed on too thin ice. No, I mean, it's very visual. You know, it, it's, and it, you know, it, it goes straight to my gut because that was a plane I used. So, you know, it's a, there are real stories out there that perhaps we should be, we don't tell them because we're told as scientists not to tell those stories. But what, it, what I'd really like to know is since Ben said that we should be talking about how we can bring change closer to immediate to people's sense. What should we be saying about the immediacy of change in the Arctic when it's so far away? What, how, would you, how would you address that? You know, anybody can. Well, I, I think it's important to have science communicated. I think scientists are called on to communicate. I think that's actually positive. The American public does have, hard, the American public hardly trusts anyone at all. But if you trust the public opinion surveys, Americans trust scientists more than many. So it's good that scientists get called to talk and good that they learn to communicate. But I think it's a, it's a profession like any other. And I'm glad that there are actually are professional communicators here in the room, journalists. and. So it's not, it's not the task of scientists alone. But I think there are, ways, there are ways to make it concrete. And I think some of those are showing the connections, the, that the, there are certainly links of change in the Arctic to change, uh, the changes in the Arctic and links to variability in extreme weather in the United States, I think is one thing that's concrete. That's certainly not, you don't want to push the science beyond what's known, but I think those, if you have to choose things to talk about, that's one good thing to mention. And uh, good, good to remember just to use concrete, I think concrete examples are good. When I have to talk about changing uh, carbon dioxide concentrations, rather than talking parts per million, I just say the air that you breathe is different than the air your grandparents breathe. And I think that sort of brings it home. Hi, uh, just a point of clarification. For all your graphics that showed ice free, what it really means technically from a satellite standpoint is 15% of the ice is left, meaning that you're sailing over an ocean where 85% of it is open water because the satellites can't pick up much difference. So the Greenpeace slide you had would still show as covered because that was about 50%. The other thing that hasn't been addressed, but it's very complex. You've had more cloud cover this year. Uh, you have a record minimum ice, but you also have a record maximum cloud. And this is one of these duh things. Right? Open water, moisture availability, polar, polar easterlies picking up clouds. So the albedo, the reflectivity of that part of the world has also changed. It's very complex. The meteorological aspects are very complex. This is going to be fantastically interesting in the next couple of years. Uh, Peter, you talked about uh, polar ice and Greenland. 
ice. And just given how close they are, they must there must be a strong coupling between them. So what are the implications for Greenland of the more rapid uh, than the models predict uh, disappearance of the, of the polar ice? Do you know that? Well, th there is work being done on that. And one question, of course, is if you are opening more of the Arctic Ocean and you, you get warmer temperatures there by, by the insulation in the surface water, that could actually have an effect on the surface temperature of the adjacent part of the Greenland ice sheet. The other part, of course, has to do with the mass balance. If you are opening the, uh, the uh, Arctic Ocean and take the sea ice away, then you could ha actually have a, a higher moisture flux out of that area that could uh, have an, an impact on the uh, ice sheet balance. There, there are modeling studies underway. I think people are starting to, to study also experimentally more this interaction between uh, ocean and, and ice sheet. And I think that there, are, there are quite a few questions that uh, you know, I, I, I hope will, will be answered within the next whatever few years to a decade that will give clarity, clarity into these uh, issues. There's also something, uh, Robin Bell and some other people here are also looking at other things and one of the issues that people are uh, interested in is the direct sea ice um, glacier. You know, when, when you've had sea ice in that location and then the sea ice is gone and then you have more warmer water, um, you know, and um, potential, you know, sort of structural changes along the front as well. Did you want to say something? We could. It's an Earth Institute <laughs> seminar, so <laughs> why not? Well, that's, you know, that is very much what we're looking at, Jim, is what, you know, as the, as you lose the sea ice, what is happening along the fronts of the fjords and how much can the ocean impact what's going on on the Greenland ice sheet? So I think there's, there's going to be the atmospheric component, which is, you know, is about half the change in the Greenland ice sheet. So that how the sea ice changes the atmosphere will influence the, that half of the mass balance. But the dynamic, basically how fast the Greenland ice sheet flows into the ocean, will be m more influenced by what's going on with the ocean temperature. Do we, is there a correlation between, or causal correlation between the warming of the ocean and its melting processes? The ocean are warming up, but we, we have the data that are is that the negligible effect or? There, there are two parts to that. You, you have yeah. the, the very surface that, uh -huh. that can warm up because you are removing the ice. And that has a, a feedback, a positive feedback on melting the ice because if you break it up and you float it into that warmer water, that is uh, one acceleration. The other one is if that very warm surface water gets just underneath the ice, it uh, helps to melt it from, from the underside. So, so we, th there is a feedback uh, from the ocean. But uh, I, with respect to the ice sheet, I, I wanted to come back to, to Robin and say, you know, there are actually stories that can be, can be told. And one story that was always very impressive to me is I, I saw these mules and I thought, whoa, this is unbelievable. You know, you have that stuff going all the way down. First, I couldn't believe it when somebody told me, but then I saw it, so I said, wow, that's great. Then people said, then I got a proposal to review from a UK group, and they proposed to put water and objects, like little golf balls with little antennas into, into that thing, and said, you know, they will show up in the East Greenland Current. And apparently, some of these things actually made it through. So that, to me, was like, you know, I, I never would have thought that you can go onto the green and ice shelf, throw something into these crevices, it reaches the ground, it moves out, and you measure it into, in the ocean. So, so there are sometimes these, these immediate, um, you know, in, intuitive, I mean, counterintuitive things that open your eyes to what is really possible. Um, speaking of Greenland, a quick question. Um, hasn't there always been ice leaving the, through the Fram Strait? And is it now going faster? Or? The, the, the uh, strait between um, Greenland and Svalbard, the Fram Strait, has always had a lot of sea ice coming through it, yes. Mm -hmm. that, that's always been a, a, the major exit for sea ice out of the Arctic. And um, about the change in the speed, I, I, don't, I don't know specifically in Fram Strait itself, but within the Arctic Ocean, we have seen that the, that the ice is moving faster now. So, so when you showed the slide of it, you, know, you were saying the multi-year ice was leaving. That's right. Is yep. that because it's 
Is that a is that a global warming? So so the effect? multi-year ice has always left through some of it has always left through Fram Strait. I mean, you can actually think of it so, sort of like a big gyre, you know, it's circulating around and it kind of wraps some of the ice back around in that area of the thick old ice and some of it peels off along the East Greenland current. And that's always happened. What happened was that there were a couple of episodes where the winds were perfectly aligned to get the old ice that had been accumulating in this area north of Canada and Greenland and sort of blew it out through Fram Strait. So you've always had some of these, you know, um, some old ice leaving. There were a couple of periods where you had more old ice leaving, and that kind of depleted the thick old ice of the Arctic. So now we have this younger, thinner ice that's more mobile and much more vulnerable to warming, as Peter was talking about. And, you know, what, what Stephanie said is true. It, it always happened in the past, right. too. But in the past, it was cold enough that after, let's say, whatever, a decade or so of depletion of the thick ice, it grew back. Right. And now we don't have the conditions anymore to grow it back. So we leave it vulnerable and, you know, it, it goes successively to, to lower extents. Can I, uh, sorry, while well, I have the microphone, um, and Siders, uh, right now to go through the, the northern sea route, you need to ask the Russians and you need to hire an icebreaker and, and pay a fee. Is it anticipated that sometime in the future people will get tired of doing that and that it will cause problems? <laughs> um, my understanding on this one, which uh, is not as informed as it should be to answer your question, is that the U.S. position is, as with most things, that international waters are international navigable and are not owned by a single territory, um, and that therefore we don't have to ask permission <laughs> to go there how much we will be enforcing that is, is unknown. And in terms of the icebreaker requirement, the, um, the options for getting an icebreaker are really put on the private industry that wants to do shipping right now. It's on the industry and it's on the insurers. So I think the bigger question is, when will Lloyds of London get sick of insuring people to go through there? There's another aspect to this too, which is the trans-Arctic shipping route um, that people hadn't been talking about until recently when they were seeing the dramatic. So that would be going directly from the Bering Strait to Fram Strait, you know, and you would be passing mainly through what's called the donut hole of international waters. Um, so that's another option. It's you know shorter and it and it bypasses some of these other issues. And so people are beginning to talk about that more seriously now too. You've touched on my question by uh, responding uh, to the latter question about international waters. Um, for quite a while, I've been thinking of that um, uh, in an interdependent manner that uh, with the massive amount of uh, fishing going around the planet and the sophistication of fishing methods, that uh, it's quite possible that the poles or portions of the, the, the planet's oceans might become the last fishing stock strongholds. So, uh, and then you just mentioned briefly that as the water is heating up, the fish are moving and migrating north. So my question, and, and I've been toying with that idea, and then by coincidence about two weeks ago, there was a column in the London Financial Times that addressed that, and it said that uh, uh, he projected or extrapolated that if we look at the, the the uh, increasing uh, acrimony discussion, acrimonic discussion taking place in the South China Sea, it's quite possible that uh, uh, these types of discussions, not only with the states uh, bordering the Arctic Ocean, are uh, becoming a little bit more uh, tense, but other nations on the planet might gravitate and think that parts of the Arctic Ocean belongs to them also that are not on the border. So that was in the London Financial Times. So. At what point is it possible that the concept of uh, nation states controlling uh, 200 miles might dissolve in the Arctic and that the rest of the planet might decide that that's an archaic law position and that the last fish stocks on the planet belong to humanity and we all going in there, we all going to scramble about and grab each other's feet and bite on each other. So that's, is that a possibility? The second thing I ask is, is that <clears throat> what's the state of uh, exploration law? I thought it was very interesting that you showed uh, Perry and the boys, or Matthew, I should say, and the boys, uh, uh, that you opened up with. Um, 
You know, of course, that the Russians, uh, well, the, the, the admiral, being in the, the, the military, the admiral of the Nautilus, who is that? what's his name? What, what's that? The, the, the admiral of the Nautilus, the Nautilus was the first submarine that, submer that, that went under the North Pole, you know, 1950, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he's a member of the Explorers Club, and approximately two to three years ago, he went to the Russians and suggested that uh, they, go, they form a joint expedition and go to the bottom of the, the Arctic Ocean. You're aware of that, aren't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. And then that, and Russians agreed and then set up a separate expedition. And about a month before they were collected, supposed to go to the bottom of the oceans, the Russians shot to the bottom of the ocean and planted a flag directly under the North Pole, claiming it for themselves. So my second question is, what's the status of the Victorian era of exploration? First, who gets there and plants the flag? How do you see that developing in law? And obviously, that is also developing in space because, you know, you know, people have just bought the Russian rover on the moon and they're claiming the land up there. So I think that, so there's two. When does the nation state law of possession of fish stocks and minerals on the planet break down? And what's the status of the Russian claim that the bottom of the ocean belongs to them? So I'll take a stab at the first one, which um, many of us have talked about, you know, s surprises will be in store. And these surprises um, are not just in the physical environment, but also in the social economic environment as well. And so we really don't know. The Arctic is being increasingly being seen as a case study for how, how we're going to deal with climate change and some of the issues that will come up, you know, relocating villages and towns and coming up with these new agreements about fishing in, in areas that were, you know, people hadn't been fishing before. So, you know, anything is possible, I would say, for that one. And I'll hand it over to you for the other. Yeah, um, in terms of claims breaking down, I'm not so sure, but uh, in terms of other nations wanting to get involved in the Arctic, we're seeing that already. Uh, China and Japan have um, interests in the Arctic and have, you know, requested to become more involved in that. Uh, so far, the Arctic Council has not really encouraged that participation for a variety of political reasons, but I do think we'll see more interest from some states like that, um, uh, particularly China and Japan, I think will continue to be interested in the Arctic. Um, if Greenland ever wins independence, I think Denmark will still stay interested in the Arctic. I mean, all kinds of scenarios could play out, as we say. You just said it's, it's a case study looking at what might happen. But there certainly will be interest in the Arctic from nations that don't touch physically on the Arctic. Uh, that's very clear. Um, for natural resources, for fishing, for a variety of reasons, I think we'll be interested. In terms of the flag on the bottom of the ocean, uh, it's far more a symbolic act than any legal status to it. Um, the symbolism there, I think, that we should draw away from this is which country cared the most to send a submarine to put a flag on the bottom of the ocean? Mm -hmm. It's not so much a, a legal claim as it is a just who had the most interest, who decided to put the resources into it, um, and it was Russia. And I think that that's telling just because it fits in with the fact they're putting $44 billion between now and 2020 into Arctic development, that they've pinned a lot of their development hopes on, on the Arctic uh, coming up. But I think the real answers in terms of who owns what up in the Arctic are going to be much more decided under UNCLOS and international legal standards than they are on the who can stick a flag there first. Just a quick point uh, to the uh, fisheries. The the fish stock will be limited in the Central Arctic, not, not the shelf seas, in the Central Arctic by the primary productivity, which is limited by the low light conditions. So it, it is, you know, I'm not an expert in that, but listening to my colleagues who study that, they project that the Central Arctic, the sort of the, the deep part of the, of the Arctic Ocean, will not develop into a very rich, um, you know, uh, fish stock, but that it's more confined to areas around uh, the, the uh, Central Arctic Ocean, like the Barents Sea, possibly the Kara Sea. I'll, I'll just mention there are uh, huge fisheries issues in Antarctica, and the strict Antarctic treaties basically govern the land. So what could happen in the, in the Southern Ocean is really another, uh, it's, a, it's a related kind of question. It's very uh, linked to climate change, uh, to, ocean, to ocean circulations, and to the productivity is what reminded me, the upwelling that brings the nutrients. Um, I'll try and frame this question as elegantly as I can, uh, because uh, I care about all science, and I don't want to sound like Mitt Romney here. Um, do you think uh, that our scientific priorities are misplaced, and it is affecting public awareness? Uh, 
recently we saw that a lot of money was spent to send um, Curiosity to Mars. And yet we say that there's no money for Arctic research. And do you think that kind of a situation, and we have got so much of coverage about what Mars is doing, uh, Curiosity is doing every day, every single move that it makes is being reported in the press. But we have a huge problem here about the Arctic, and yet we don't seem to be getting the coverage that we need. Um, and so my question is, is it um, affecting public perception? Uh, I, uh, public perception, I think, uh, you're, you're broadly raising the question of how, does, how, do, how, do, how do public bodies establish scientific priorities? And how do you, so you're raising the question of we could say, well, should there be a little more for the Arctic and less for other planets? And then there would be the questions of allocating broadly planetary sciences versus health. And um, I'm actually going to stay away from that one. I think it's a, uh, I, I think that it's not a fixed pie that we're dividing up. I think there are many surprises and connections. Um, I, it's really remarkable how we understand the Earth's planet um, atmospheric circulation better because we understand the atmospheres of the other planets and large satellites in our in our solar system. So I'm just going to say that science is wonderful. There are un unexpected connections, and if the the funding for research in the Arctic doesn't have to come only from the Mars exploration, it can come from other places too. And I'll stop there. And I would like to add that there ha we just came through the um, International Polar Year of 2007-2009, and it was a, a huge undertaking by, you know, an international, internationally, um, and a large con many countries put a lot of resources into trying to understand the changes in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. And so there, you know, um, there has been su support for research, and then um, and some of that, you know, support is continuing. So I wouldn't say that we, there's no research support. Um, but uh, the other thing is the communication and education. The National Science Foundation, as I said, just funded, you know, us among others to to communicate about these issues because they see that it really is important, and they need to find better ways and different ways of reaching people. Um, because you know, clearly, as Ben said, you know, the ways that we've been trying, you know, haven't. Been as effective as, as they potentially could be. So they're, they're, they're funding research into how to communicate better, and they're also uh, funding um, some um, partnerships so that people can collaborate with others in trying to, to get um, messages out as well. I know something about the that ages, even by osmosis, but 40 years help you to understand it. I mean, imagine if a NASA administrator went to Congress and said, out of my huge budget of $15 billion a year, imagine, I want to go and explore the Arctic. They will tell them, no, it doesn't belong to NASA. It belongs to NOAA or some other agency. So it's not that NASA would have decided to go to Mars or to the Atlantic. I mean, certain budget are earmarked to do something, and NASA has a certain mission to explore outer space, and um, Mars is there. Uh, but uh, I just don't see how any NASA scientist or administrator could possibly convince Congress that rather than going there, we are going here. That would raise, that would raise, let's put it diplomatic as you want to be diplomatic, the curiosity of other, of other agencies. Say, well, you know, NOAA is there and it's got the mandate to do, to do that. So yes. it's, not that, it's not that, that. Um. So Robin Bell, I, I should have introduced her before. So she's a scientist at Lamont Doherty um, Earth Observatory at Columbia University, and um, she is also a, a polar scientist. And so she'll she'll talk about this. But I also just wanted to mention that the that the image that Ben liked the most was one produced by NASA, um, showing the. Yeah, yeah. So so um, they are doing work for the Arctic know, as well. Know, know. It's actually very interesting because the chief scientist uh, NASA now is currently actually a cryospheric scientist. So the profile of uh, the study of the polar regions on our planet, not just the polar regions yeah. of Mars, has actually raised in profile significantly at NASA. So I think part of it is both NASA and the scientific community continuing to effectively communicate why, why this is important. So I think it's a little more hopeful than you think. I think I'm, I'm you, very hopeful. Yeah. No, but actually, it's, it's not an astronaut who's the chief scientist. Yeah. It's somebody who studies those moulons. Yeah, yeah. So. 
So we'll, we're coming close to the end. So we'll take one more question. Yes. Thank you. I might be piggy piggybacking on uh, some of the questions that have been raised so far, but my question, the concern that I have so far, is that there's so much incentive to go to these coastal areas of the Arctic and to start any sort of business uh, business opportunities there in terms of developing of these uh, particular areas. So the question is uh, the following. Do you see uh, this sort of uh, move towards these areas as a possible threat for or a possible spur for the f uh, further advancement of these climate change activities that are taking place already? Short answer is yes. Um, the more uh, activity that happens up in the Arctic, I mean, if, if we're sending planes up to the Arctic, we're sending ships up to the Arctic, they are burning fossil fuels, the very things that are causing the global warming to cause the sea ice melting, and they're causing them in the area where the sea ice is melting. Uh, the more infrastructure we put up there, unless the infrastructure we build up there is somehow cleaner or better, more efficient than the infrastructure we've used other places, yes, I do think there is possibility for a feedback there that will cause uh, greater problems. But I also want to caveat that by saying, I think the message I hope to get across is not that there's going to be a huge race for development in the Arctic. It's that there will be increase, but it's going to be slow and it's going to be cautious because it's, it, it's too dangerous and too expensive to have a race up there right now. The, the reason that I want to stress the lack of infrastructure and the lack of response capabilities is because it might take 10 years to really increase the development in the Arctic, but it will also take 10 years to plan and get the resources in place for our response. So it's not that there's some crisis in terms of our response, it's just that planning needs to happen well in advance. You all know how quickly our government moves, so anything that we want them to do needs to be thought about much further. The, the other, if I could add another feedback loop, there's certainly the emissions that are associated with the exploration and development, but there, there are also the emissions that would be associated with the, uh, with the oil and gas that's extracted there. And um, I, I, I'm glad to know that we're being cautious. I'm not sure any of us know really what level of caution the Russians are undertaking, but I think broadly the hope is to develop new forms of, uh, to find less carbon intensive energy sources. And so uh, the hope, the expectation that there's a, that we can postpone that because we can get oil and gas from the Arctic might, uh, th th if we hope to get our oil and gas from the Arctic, we might postpone those other development of those other sources. But as we discover how hard it is to get that, that might point out the urgency of developing these alternatives, and that might promote some of the coalitions that we've been talking about that look to these new energy technologies. So I think it really, and that's another thing that remains unknown, is how the hopes for the Arctic uh, oil and gas play out in the whole energy future. I, I think, although I believe that there will be development, and the question is still open how, how fast it will go, there is also some evidence of uh, what, what Anne said, uh, that it is, you know, the, the, the Russians just uh, stopped development of the Stockman field, which at least they put it on hold. And this was based on, on the high logistical costs. So I think that was helped by the fact that a lot of other gas fields were, were developed through fracking and other, other methods, which in themselves have some questions. But it, it showed that there is still an extra price to be paid and if there is no real shortage that drives them towards that, they will, they will probably use uh, economic reasoning uh, in, the, in these decisions. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. I think it was a really interesting set of questions. And um, let's just have one more round of um, thanks for the panel.